Okay, students, welcome back to another beautiful pre-calculus honors lesson day. Okay, this is Tuesday, um, the 24th of April, I think, even though I'm making this video on the Monday. Um, so yesterday, you guys should have, uh, you know, finished up that, um, you know, take-home assignment that you had. Okay, take-home test for curve sketching and uh, optimization problems. And I should be have gotten that already, um, you know, yesterday by midnight. We got to jump into a new chapter here, but first a little do problem to kind of play around with a little bit, you know, so maybe uh, write this problem down and then pause it. Okay, and, um, you know, when you come back, we'll talk about how to do the problem. Okay, so hopefully you're back now. Um, any housekeeping that needs to be done before this? I don't think so. Starting a new uh, chapter today, you know, we're going to talk about what that chapter is in a second. Just uh, make sure you've been watching these videos. You know, I've noticed my amount of views start to dwindle a little bit. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. If you have things going on personally, totally understand that, okay? Um, if you're just slacking off, though, don't do it. You need to know this stuff for next year, okay? If you want to take AP Calculus AB or BC, if you want to take BC, you better really know what you're doing. You better have the work ethic for it, okay? So a little do now action here. You might notice that we want to take the derivative of x squared plus y squared equals y cubed. We want to find dy over dx. Remember, that means we want the derivative of y with respect to x, with respect to, uh, to x. Um, and this right here, if you want to take the derivative with respect to, to one variable and there are other variables present, that's an implicit differentiation situation you might remember. Um, you know, whenever x's and y's are frolicking about together, it's an implicit differentiation situation. So really, you could do it two ways. You could just say, hey, you know what? I'm taking the derivative with respect to x. Anytime I see a term with an x in it, I'll take the derivative like normal. And if I see a term with a y in it, I'll take the derivative like normal and put a dy over dx next to it. Where does that come from? It's really just the chain rule, okay? We could break up derivatives over addition over here to take the derivative of x squared, drop the two down like it's hot, rewrite the x, raise it to the one less. But then you gotta multiply by the derivative of the inside with respect to x. And the derivative of x with respect to x is one or dx over dx, which we never really write. This is really a silly way to just write 2x, okay? But essentially, this is what's going on conceptually. Then when you take the derivative of y squared, drop the 2 down like it's hot, rewrite the y, raise it to the first. But now multiply by the derivative of the inside. The inside is y. You want to take the derivative with respect to x. That's dy over dx equal to 3y squared times the derivative of the inside, dy over dx. And a lot of people would just go right to saying, hey, the derivative of x squared is 2x. Plus the derivative of y squared we know is 2y. Oop, just took the derivative of something. I had a y in it with respect to x. Got to indicate respect to x. X, I'm going to give you respect on this today, your daughter's wedding. And if you don't get that joke, play it for your parents. Maybe they'll understand what movie I'm trying to represent right there. Stavros gets it. All right, 3y squared, uh, dy over dx. Okay, over here. So a lot of people go right to this spot. There's dy over dx. That's what I want to solve for. I'll put it on the left. Okay, so I'll subtract 2x from both sides. Let's see if this is too quick for you. Over here, we'll have 2y dy over dx minus 3y squared dy over dx. Factor out of dy over dx. And you're going to have 2y uh, minus 3y squared quantity times dy over dx. And then we could divide by z bubble. And we get that dy over dx is equal to negative 2x over 2y minus 3y squared. So that's what it is to differentiate implicitly, okay? That's when you want to take the derivative um, of something with respect to a variable, and there are other variables present, okay? And you don't even need to take the derivative with respect to x. A lot of times in the real world, we take the derivative with respect to t. Here we want to find dy over dt. This is the derivative of y with respect to t. You know, why is t so important? And this says with respect to t, not with respect tot, okay? If you put the, the t and the o2 close together. Napoleon, give me some of your tots. Anyway, so, um, you know, why do we take the derivative with respect to t? Well, a derivative is a slope, right? A, a rate of change, an instantaneous rate of change. This would be the instantaneous rate of change with respect to t. T represents time, okay? So when things are moving and you want to know the rate at which, you know, that thing is moving at some specific uh, time, well, then you want to take the derivative with respect to T. So that's what we're going to talk about more today. People are like, well, how the heck am I supposed to do that? Just like before, use chain rule everywhere. Differenti differentiate, uh, differentiate, or whatever, right? Differentiate implicitly, okay? Drop the two down, rewrite the X, raise it to the first. Now to multiply by the derivative of the inside, remember that the inside is x. We want to take the derivative with respect to t. That's dx over dt, the derivative of x with respect to t. Plus, let's take the derivative of y squared, drop that 2 down, rewrite the y, raise it to the first. And now, look, we got to multiply by the derivative of y with respect to t. That's dy over dt, which is what we want, by the way. Okay, and over here, 3y squared 
multiply by the derivative of the inside with respect to t dy over dt. So you can take the derivative with respect to a variable that's not even present. You'll just see other rates show up. You know, here, this dx over dt, he's a rate, the rate at which x is changing with respect to time. But I want dy over dt. So like before, I'll subtract the 2x dx over dt from both sides. I'll subtract the 3y squared dy over dt and factor out a dy over dt. Hopefully that's not too fast for you. So inside we get dy over dt times the quantity, what, 2y minus 3y squared. And now I can divide by the bubble once again, zibubul. And I get dy over dt equals negative 2x dx over dt divided by the quantity 2y minus 3y squared. So it looks similar to the previous answer that we got, but there's a rate involved here. You know, the rate at which x was changing with respect to x was really just a 1, dx over dx. The rate which x is changing with respect to t, that's different. It's unknown at this point. And that's going to show up in the types of problems that we're doing today. My personal favorite types of calculus problems when I was, uh, you know, sitting in pre-calculus honors back in good old 1996, that's 1996. Let's get a little star action going. Somebody at home maybe do the honors, you know, a little star action. What do you think, Flanny? Flanagan, can you do the honors? Not bad. Star! All right, a little star action here. And really, this is chapter three continued still. Chapter three continued. Remember, chapter three is just applications of the derivative. We did curve sketching. It's abstract application really right there. Then we moved that you know, to real-world application optimizing. Now we're talking about something known as related rates. Really cool topic, much more mathematical if you didn't like those optimization problems. Uh, these are real world applicable, but a little bit more mathematical and less commonsensical than the other problems were as far as optimization. Uh, you wanna talk about related rates? tell you a little story. Um, you know, I was cruising around Elwood way back around Christmas time, okay, before all this madness happened. And I have family around Elwood, okay, I'm, I'm here all the time. And I was driving down the road, and I happened to, to look, um, you know, in a house, and I saw somebody walk out of the house with a big extension ladder and a bunch of Christmas lights, right? Because they were, they were going to show, you know, hang up their Christmas lights. And I just glance over, and I noticed that that's one of my students there, that that's Jack Shaleen, okay, known as Shaleen Dion, okay, to, to his friends. And I'm like, oh, so Jack's actually, you know, hang up some Christmas lights, I should say hello. But I get like mesmerized by the fact that I'm looking at his house, here's his house right here, and here's the ground. And he comes over here and he puts the ladder down. Thor puts the hammer down, Shaleen puts the ladder down. You want me to put the hammer down? Sorry, I was watching the Avengers last night. Okay, and all I can think about when he puts this ladder against the house is that, OMG, he just formed a right triangle. So I pull to the side of the road so I can watch what's happening. Some people call it lurking, but whatever. Um, anyway, so I notice that right triangle and Jack goes up here and he starts to hang, you know, his Christmas lights. And then I notice that the, the, the ladder actually begins to slide down the side of the house a little bit, okay? I was about to leave, but now I'm like, suddenly this, this situation has gotten interesting right here, and I see the ladder start to slide down, and any responsible adult would normally think about, you know, like alerting the authorities or alerting Jack or something like that, but I'm so mesmerized in my calculus mind, all I can think about is that when the ladder's actually sliding down the side of the house, that this distance right here is actually getting smaller and smaller, okay? The distance from the top of the ladder to the ground, and I realize that if something is getting smaller, well, obviously it has a rate of change, There's the rate at which it's getting smaller and the rate of change of this distance right here would be negative okay when something is getting smaller its rate of change is negative negative. and at the same time you know all i can think about is that this side down here between the bottom of the house and the bottom of the ladder that side's actually getting bigger and bigger as this thing slides down the side of the house okay so i'm like wow if that distance is getting bigger that means its rate of change is going to be positive. And I actually realize, you know, the rate at which this distance is getting smaller and the rate at which this distance is getting bigger, those two rates, they're related to one another, okay? So this, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is a great related rate type of situation. I got to get this down so that I can have a nice problem for my pre-calc honors kids to do. So at that moment, I drive away. Uh, Jack, in all seriousness, sorry I didn't say anything around Christmas, but I hope you're okay. I hope everything turned out uh, all right, okay? Um, you know, normally an adult would actually see what's going on, but really, you know, I had to write this down. I had to get my thoughts down on paper. Um, so that's the deal as far as related rates are concerned, okay? They're actually going to tell you the rate at which one thing is changing, and they're going to ask you the, the rate at which another thing is changing. At a specific instant, though, because these rates aren't always constant. You know, think about it. If the, this ladder is sliding down the side of the house, the rate at which this distance is getting smaller, it's not going to be a constant rate of change, okay? It's actually going to speed up as time goes on because of acceleration, you know, actually bringing the ladder down. So that's something that we're going to have to speak about with related rate types of problems. They're going to give you a rate, and they're going to ask for a rate. 
but they're going to ask for a rate at a specific time t. And there's a process for these problems, right? Just like there was for the optimization problems. This one's a lot easier and they'll all be geometric situations. We won't really do the non-geometric types of situations. But as far as the process is concerned, you know, if it's geometric, you want to start by drawing a diagram and then you want to label the given. They'll tell you how long some new, uh, you know, measurements are. They'll tell you how quickly something is changing. That's the rate I was talking about. So let's draw a diagram and label the given. Draw a diagram and label the given and label the given, y'all. The given. Okay, after we do that, you're gonna see that you're gonna have multiple variables and you're gonna wanna know the rate at which one variable is changing with respect to time, but you're gonna have to relate that variable to other variables. So you wanna find an equation that relates the variables. Find an equation, and we'll talk about those equations in a couple minutes. Find an equation that relates the variables. That relates the variables. Yes, I do. Sorry, I wanted to get my Palpatine voice going on. And then finally, you're going to want to know the rate at which something is changing with respect to time, which means a rate of change take a derivative. But with respect to time, you want to do so with respect to T. And you're not going to see a T in your formulas, okay? I guess you could in certain situations, but you won't really in this unit right here. But what you want to do is you want to differentiate implicitly with respect to T. Differentiate differentiate who could spell not me remember if i was good at spelling i'd be teaching at hogwarts differentiate implicitly implicitly with respect to t with respect to t that sounds really cool too right you know after this whole quarantine is over your friend's like hey man let's go out you know quarantine uh, ending celebration let's go to the library and hang out and you can be like no nah, man i'm gonna stay home differentiate implicitly with respect to t they're gonna look at you and be like wow that dude's gonna change the world anyway um units units i need units okay units for these problems very important units are always important but you'll see with every related rate problem you'll see for the most part um they'll provide you with units and remember the cardinal rule on units if they give units we give units back as far as an equation that relates to variables we're just talking about some geometric formulas all right, some that you're familiar with, some that you're not so familiar with. We'll do the two easiest ones today, and that would be the circle and then the three-dimensional circle, which is a sphere. We'll talk about that in a second. The reason a circle is such an easy type of problem is that when you're talking about a circle, you know, changing with respect to time, and that's what happens. happens. These, these diagrams, they're going to be in flux, okay? You're going to want to label each side that's changing with a variable. We know the side is getting smaller when Jack was sliding down the side of the house, so we know that this has to be a variable side, and this right here is getting bigger. This is variable, but the extension ladder would actually always be a constant, right? Because that wouldn't actually change as it slides down the side of the house. Um, with a right triangle, you have three linear measurements. It's much more complicated. We'll talk about it tomorrow. With a circle, you only have the one linear measurement that's the radius and the radius is either going to be getting bigger or it's going to be getting smaller nothing can remain constant in a circle if the radius gets bigger or smaller if the radius is changing that means the area of the circle will also be changing okay an area is pi r squared you should already have that memorized but it's something you're supposed to know um so if the radius gets bigger or smaller the area is also going to get bigger or smaller and at the same time the circumference is also going to get bigger or smaller, okay? And believe it or not, to get the circumference formula, which you should know is 2 pi r, um, if you take the area formula and you actually differentiate with respect to r, drop the 2 down like it's hot, 2 times pi is 2 pi, rewrite r, raise it to the 1 less, the first, and you took the derivative with respect to r, so you don't need to multiply by the derivative of the inside, it would just be 1 dr over dr, you can see that's actually the circumference formula for a circle. So the circumference of a circle actually describes the rate at which the area of a circle is changing. Nothing we really use in class, but it's kind of interesting. So these diagrams you draw, they're always going to be in flux, okay? So you're going to have to label any side that's changing using a variable. With a circle, there's only one linear measurement. It's always going to be changing. The radius will never remain constant, because if the radius remains constant, that means the circle is remaining constant. And that's not going to happen in these problems. You could drop like a pebble, you know, in the water, and it's going to be like a circle opening up, okay? You know, so it's not going to have a constant radius. Three-dimensional circle, the sphere, which you could also use to kill a boar if you need meat. I'm just killing, okay? I'm just killing. That sounds horrible. I'm just kidding, okay? Look, I've been in quarantine. Don't play these videos when your parents are around. Just kidding. Um, a three-dimensional circle is a sphere. Also a fantastic book, by the way, written by Michael Crichton. They also made a movie. I'm not extremely fond of it, but 
way before the movie was ever made. Me and my brother were hanging out talking about the book, and we were like, who would be the best person to play each role? We actually cast the movie in our heads years before it came out. I think somebody was lurking about, you know, outside our window. Anyway, with a sphere, if you draw that three-dimensionally, it's also a very easy type of situation because there's only one linear measurement. There's that radius. We don't talk about area with a sphere. We talk about surface area. But first, we talk about volume. Four-thirds pi r cubed, one of the most important calculus formulas, not really a calculus formula, but used uh, quite often in calculus. On the AP these days, they usually just give you the formula because people are too much of a slacker to memorize it. Um, also, things have changed. You know, Common Core has destroyed everything. So I think you still talk about this in Common Core geometry, but a great formula to actually know. If you take the derivative... Um, with respect to R of the volume of a sphere, you get the surface area of a sphere. They usually use just one S for surface area, not SA, but you could use SA. Drop the three down like it's hot. Three times four thirds is four. Rewrite that pi, he's a constant. Raise R to the one less. That's actually a formula for the surface area of a sphere, much lesser known. All right, so look, <clears throat> let's dive in, do some problems here. You might be like, what the heck is this crazy person talking about? These problems aren't nearly as bad as you might think. You got that related rate packet. Let's jump in. Let's go to number two. Number two. Um, assume. I hate that word, assume. You know what happens when we assume. It's inappropriate. I can't say it, you know, in a class video. Um, but you know what I'm talking about. Assume that oil spilled from a ruptured tanker spreads in a circular pattern whose radius increases at a constant rate of two feet per second. How fast is the area of the spill increasing, that's what you say increasing, when the radius of the spill is 60 feet. Should be obvious this is increasing. If the radius is increasing, obviously the area is going to increase. But look, let's re-read uh, that, okay? Assume that oil spilled from a ruptured tanker spreads in a circular pattern whose radius increases at a constant rate of two feet per second. That's a rate. They just gave you a rate. Now they want to know how fast is the area of the spill increasing. They want a rate and they gave you a specific instant when the radius of the spill is 60 feet. Sometimes the specific instant, they'll say like, you know, when T is equal to three minutes or something, you know, after three minutes have elapsed. But a lot of times with the specific instant, they'll actually tell you what a measurement is. Um, this is how you know it's a related rate problem because they give you a rate and they ask for a rate at a specific instant, okay? And look, draw a diagram, label the given. The diagram you draw will always be in flux, so we know it's circular, but this oil that spilled, this circle is growing, it's getting bigger. I know it has a radius, and people are like, no, oh, the radius is 60. No, all right, the radius is only 60 at one given instant of time. This radius is really variable as time goes on. These diagrams you draw are in flux. The radius is changing, they even tell you the rate at which the radius is changing, two feet per second. That's the rate of change of the radius with respect to time. That's the derivative of the radius with respect to time. You could say like R prime of T as well. That's the same as this. But usually for related rates, we write D, whatever the heck is changing, over DT. And that's two feet per second. And that's just the rate at which R is changing with respect to time. That's the rate they gave you. Think about the rate they want. They want to know how fast the area is increasing when the radius is 60 feet. So that wouldn't be the derivative of the radius with respect to time. That'd be the derivative of the area with respect to time. So they want dA over dt. Then I'm going to say the specific instant when the radius is equal to 60 feet. So that's what it means to draw a diagram and label the given, okay? They'll give you a rate, they'll ask for a rate, label those, and then they should tell you a specific instant, which should really be a, uh, you know, a measurement at a certain time. Now, get a formula that relates the variables. Well, think about it. There better be an A in the formula where A represents area of the circle because I'm going to get a DA over DT after I take the derivative. That's what I want, DA over DT. And it should also have an R in it where R represents the radius of the circle. What's the formula that... that compares, you know, um, you know, relates the area of a circle to the radius of a circle, area equals pi r squared. Very good. All right. So you're going to want those letters inside the formula. And now we'll differentiate implicitly with respect, excuse me, to t. And the reason that the circle is easy is because on either side, you only have one variable. If you had more variables, if this was a volume of a cylinder, you put a little h right here, the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> then you need to go product rule. Okay. We'll be there in a couple days. Sorry, I got the hiccups, um, but um, we're not quite there yet. So the circle and the sphere are the two easiest. Let's take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. The derivative of a with respect to t, that's dA over dt. 
equal to drop the two down like it's hot. Two times pi is two pi. Take R and raise it to the first, raise it to the one less. But you got to shang, 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 chain rule. Okay, look, we got to take the derivative of the inside. The argument was R with respect to T. That's dr over dt. The moral of the story is, if you take the derivative of an expression that has any letter in it, when you're done, you're going to put d that letter over dt, as long as you're differentiating with respect to t. It's not as bad as you might think, because now I know what some things are. Like, I don't know what da over dt is. I want it. So at least he showed up. So da over dt is equal to. See, now you have to understand that we're looking at one specific instant of time. We're, we're finding the rate of change at one specific instant. When we take the derivative implicitly with respect to t, essentially, we have stopped time. Usually people start laughing in class when I do that. You know you're laughing at home. Um, so this is one specific instant. What specific instant is it? It's the specific instant when the radius is 60 feet. So to indicate I'm looking at the specific instant when the radius is 60 feet, I replace the R with a 60. By the way, I got to replace dr over dt as well. I know it's 2, and that makes it easy, right? Um, 60 times 2 is 120 times 2 is 240. 240 pi units i need units and think about it this is the rate at which area is changing with respect to time area is not going to be represented in feet area is going to be represented in square feet okay so this is really square feet um divided by uh the difference in time okay which is in seconds so square feet per second so square feet per seconds couple different ways to do this um if you want you just realize it's an area that's changing so that means a measurement of area is going to be a square unit and then you get to put with respect to time you know person unit of time um a lot of people like to roll units into their calculations you could do that sometimes i think things get actually a little bit more complicated but this 60 right here is in feet right and the dr over dt is in feet per second Feet per second is really feet over seconds, by the way. So when you multiply these together, feet times feet is feet squared. One times second is seconds. You get feet per squared per second. I like to put the units down when I'm done with the calculation. Some people like to roll the units inside. I know you do that in chemistry a lot. Um, but sometimes it can become, you know, a little confusing in this class. So I don't do stuff like that. You know, I know Harrington teaches it that way. That's the way they used to do it um, back in the Roaring Twenties. That's when Harrington first started teaching, so that's probably why he does it that way. Um, anyway, let's try another one, okay? Let's try, um, you know, I'm not hungry because I just ate, okay? Let's try number eight. A spherical balloon, yeah, a sphere, is inflated with gas at a rate of 20 cubic feet per minute. I smell a rate. And then they want to know how fast is the radius of the balloon increasing? They want a rate, and now they give you a specific instant of time okay so draw a diagram you know it's a related rate problem because they gave you a rate they ask for a rate at a specific instant let's draw a diagram even though you notice the diagram for the sphere and the circle they're kind of useless okay because you can never label what an actual measurement is everything's in flux i know the radius is changing we actually want to know how fast the radius is increasing. That's not the rate they gave us. They told us that the balloon was inflated with gas at a rate of 20 cubic feet per minute. If you're inflating something with gas, you're filling up the inside. That's the rate at which the volume is changing with respect to time. Maybe some people are like, yeah, but you know, if you're filling it up, maybe that's the surface area. It's not. But the real reason it's volume here is because they told you 20 cubic feet per minute. When you see cubic feet over here, you know, that feet cubed, that's what indicates that it's actually volume, okay? So you gotta look at these things that way. If they said square feet per minute, that would be area, surface area with a three-dimensional object. Anyway, volume is V, and that's the rate at which V is changing with respect to T. That's dV over dT. Some people are like, oh, that's the rate at which V is increasing because the balloon's being inflated. That's right in this case. Just be careful. When you write a D whatever over DT down, that's a generic rate of change. You actually need to indicate whether it's positive or whether it's negative. But this volume is getting bigger because the balloon's inflating. That's how I know it's 20 cubic feet per second, per minute, pardon me. Um, if it was actually, you know, deflating, then that would be negative 20 cubic feet per minute. Something we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, when you write these down, they're generic. You need to indicate whether they're negative or positive. If they tell you it's the rate at which the balloon is, is deflating, they won't say that the rate is negative, but they're implying it in the context of the word. Something we'll speak about tomorrow. Um, what do we want? Well, now we actually want to know how fast, how fast is a rate? Um, is the radius of the balloon increasing? So we want dr over dt. 
Now, this is really the rate at which R is changing with respect to time. If it's getting smaller, that would be a negative rate. But if they want how fast, by the way, how fast is always indicative of speed. And speed is always positive. So you're always going to want to take an absolute value when they want to know how fast. But believe it or not, in the AP, more often they actually want to know the rate at which something is changing, which means you need to indicate whether it's positive or negative. Um, they give us a specific instant when R is equal to two feet. Okay, so draw a diagram, label the given, get a formula that relates to variables. This formula had better have an R in it, where R represents radius. And it also can certainly have a V in it, where V represents volume. Volume! And that would be our volume of a sphere formula, right? Four-thirds pi R cubed. And now we could differentiate implicitly with respect to T. The derivative of V with respect to T is DV over DT, or DV over D equal to, take the derivative here with respect to, to t, right? Drop the three down, three times four thirds pi is four pi, raise r to the one less, but please don't forget that dr over dt. A lot of people leave that out. In this case, it wouldn't matter, right? Because you want dr over dt, you leave it out, you'd be like, oh, you know what, I forgot it. Obviously, I need to put it there. But in the previous problem that we did, suppose you left out the dr over dt, you would just not multiply by two, you get 120 pi, great chance in multiple choice 120 pi could be there. So remember when you're differentiating implicitly with respect to t, you better put a d whatever over dt next to it. dv over dt is actually what I know right now, that's 20 right there, four pi is a constant, it's a constant. R at this specific instant is two, okay? This is how I'm actually indicating the instant at which I'm stopping time, the instant when the radius is two, and now we just gotta solve a little bit for dr over dt. So this is what, four times pi times four, 16 pi times dr over dt, divide by 16 pi on both sides. Don't subtract 16 pi. You don't know your maths if you're doing that. And that means here's my answer, dr over dt. You know, if it's multiple choice, you're probably gonna have to simplify. So divide by four top and bottom, that's what I would do. So five over four pi, and then units, I need units. Instead of rolling them into the calculation, just think about this. It's dr over dt, the rate at which a radius is changing. A radius is a linear length, okay? It's not measured in square in square feet. It's not measured in cubic feet. It's just measured in feet. But this is a rate. It has to be per some instant of time, which would be minutes in this case. So 5 over 4 pi feet per minute, okay? And be careful when you're writing these answers down. Don't write this, because this right here really looks like 5 fourths pi, which is not equal to five over four pi. I've seen people do this all the time. You know, some people write it down this way. They write five fourths pi. This is wrong, okay? Because technically what's going on is you divide first, you, you know, moving left to right, PEMDAS, multiplication, division, whichever comes first. Five divided by four is five fourths. Then you multiply by pi. These are not the correct answer. So make sure you extend that horizontal division bar. Just something I've seen people mess around with um, and get incorrect. So remember, related rate problems. They'll give you a rate. They'll ask for a rate of specific instant. Draw a diagram, label the given, find a formula that relates to variables, differentiate implicitly with respect to T, and then you could plug in and actually solve. Not as bad as you might think. Uh, those are easier problems today though. Tomorrow we'll get a little bit more uh, rocking and rolling. And I uh, hope everybody's doing safe and healthy and everybody's happy. And uh, see y'all manana. Adios.